Uh, so, finding the four, so, uh, high points that all happen is on time. Because it's not a UI on top So, we'll play, if I remember right, we're going to play at 2 o'clock. And then, we'll do like 2 o'clock and then we'll now see the results. I think we I think we I expected to continue to swell, the need to plant more churches is all the more critical. That's why in 2021, Scent Network SBTC was formed as a church planting partnership between the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention and the North American Mission Board. This partnership has strengthened church planting efforts in Texas through the process of assessing, training, caring for, and coaching planters. The collaboration has helped extend the years of support a planter can receive, as well as provide his family with one full year of free health insurance, which is often a common barrier for planters with families. And planters are also receiving an initial deposit into a retirement account through Guidestone. Since a partnership was formed, Send Network SBTC has deployed more church planting catalysts into the field across Texas, opened new assessment and retreat centers in locations including Dallas and Houston, and started church planting residencies all across the state. As a result, the numbers of planters assessed and churches planted are encouragingly on the rise. And as Send Network SBTC continues to expand its reach across Texas, more and more people will have access to the hope and love of Christ. Thank you for your generosity through Rich Texas. Send Network SBTC, a family of churches, planting churches everywhere for everyone. Good morning, everyone. Brother Brian, I appreciate you 
being here today. Thank you. Kirk, it's good to see you and your family back there. Let me see who else is. And I'm probably going to miss somebody. Now oh, there's some old faces that I won't even. <laughs> What we just saw, uh, it, I mentioned planting churches. Folks, if we're not plan, praying for the church, then we're not doing what we've been called to do. Amen. There's lots of struggles that exist today for the church. And once again, I'm going to remind God's people to do what they're supposed to be doing. And that's praying. What a good opportunity we have right now, really. Father, as we come into your presence, Father, united in Christ here. Father, search our hearts. And Father, if there's anything that doesn't need to be there, Father, bring that to our attention. Father, purify us. Father, make us ready. Father, to do what you've called us to do. Father, in what better way is for your word to be shared, Father, that we might absorb that word here today. But, Father, that we might leave this place not just another Sunday, but, Father, change for your glory. Father, that we can go out and tell the world that's lost about a Savior that loves them and wants to have a relationship with them. Father, our church is struggling sometimes. Father, your church, wherever it might be, Father, whatever the name is on the front door, Father, your church that shares Jesus Christ to a world that is lost, Father, needs to be unified in the days to come. Father, it's been washed in blood. Father, there should be no separation. We should be unified. In Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Father, use us here today at Highland. Father, if revival needs to start, let it start here. And Father, move out. Father, that all can hear your word. Yes. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to freely come and gather and to worship you. And Father, help us make the most of our time that we have in fellowship with you and other believers that we might be made ready for the task at hand. Father, thank you for this day and all that it's going to have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you'll please stand for our pledges. And Emma's pretty tired, but she's going to come up and try to lead us in our pledges. She has to go to school, she said. I'm so sorry, Emma. Thank you, Emma.
beginning in verse 16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. We want to be ready to go out into the world to do what God has called us to do. We need to get into the Word. Yeah. Any answers that we have, any doubts, anything that needs to be addressed, God's Word is there for us to prepare us for what's ahead. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you, Father, for your willingness to prepare us. Father, in the love that you have, that, Father, that we're even here that we can have a relationship with us, much less use it. Father, I just pray that we go to your word. And Father, that we're enriched and made ready for the task at hand. Yeah. And Father, I, as it's been prayed already this morning, Father, for the word that's being shared here, Father, let us be attentive. Father, let us know what we're supposed to do and be, Father, from the text here today. Father, prepare us because the world is in need of your word. Father, I lift up this offering to you, Father, as we, we worship with our tithes. Yeah. Father, let it bring glory to you. And Father, let you use it to glorify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
Sang it. We're done. I'll tell you what. Come on down. I'm going to introduce you to Brother Keith, and he's going to come share with us. All right. Father, I lift Brother Keith to you as he comes and shares. I pray, Father, that. Uh, as he speaks, we would have open hearts and clear minds to hear and, Father, to digest what you've given us this morning for me. So, Lord, just use him and bless him. And we would ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. We kind of sometimes get it right. right? <laughs> well... Sometimes I get it right when I preach, too, so we'll see how it goes. My name is Keith Bryant, and right off the bat, I want to uh, apologize if I start to cough or if I have to stop and get a drink of water or maybe even spray my throat. Five years ago, um, I suffered through larynx cancer, and I'm doing quite well now, but uh, the, the, re the treatment uh, did a number on my throat. And so I'm not able to sing like I used to. I never could sing very good, but I loved to sing. And now it's hard to get words out of my mouth to sing. Uh, I still am able to preach, so uh, I am thankful for the opportunity to do that. I was raised in a little town that you might know, not far from here, called Stanet, Texas. Yeah, my mom and dad uh, settled there. My dad worked for Phillips for almost 40 years. And uh, I knew this little guy back here, Alan Price, when he was seriously just a little guy. I was the youth director at First Baptist Church, Demet, where they ordained me and I moved on from there and have been several places since. I've ministered in Idaho, Texas, and Eastland, Texas, Morris, Texas, Stanette, Texas, uh, I can't remember where else. 
uh, in Kansas most of our life. I was pastor at First Southern Baptist Church, Liberal, Kansas, and then I was a director of missions in Central Baptist Association in the central part of Kansas from Nebraska to Oklahoma. And then I served with a church at, uh, called Cross Point Church in Hutchinson before we retired. Moved back to Amarillo to help me closer to my mother. Um, and uh, she passed away shortly after we moved, moved to Amarillo, but we're glad to be back in the Texas Panhandle. I was interim pastor at Stanette uh, just uh, over a year ago. And so it's good to be here, to be back among friends. And I promise you, if we talked long enough, we would know somebody, uh, the same people, because I have a lot of friends here in Pampa, Texas, um, who've, uh, who've lived here most of their lives. So I am glad to be with you this morning. A few years ago, I decided that I wanted to memorize uh, a passage of Scripture. And it's in uh, Romans chapter 5. And if you want to turn your Bibles there, you can follow along. <clears throat> whatever translation you have, it's probably not the same as I'm going to quote it to you because this is Keith Bright's paraphrase. Then we're going to come back and look at each verse, and I use the English Standard Version for my teaching Bible. But it, it goes something like this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. We rejoice in the hope of glory of God, not only so, but we rejoice in suffering, because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has filled our hearts with the Holy Spirit, which He has given to us. You see, just at the right time, while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will one die for a righteous man, though some might die for a good man. But God demonstrated His love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since... Therefore, we have been justified by his blood. We have been saved from the wrath of God. I'm going to talk to you this morning about living by faith and what that means. Now, we talk about that word faith in a lot of different ways. And my personal feeling is, and this is truly just personal on my part, is that sometimes we misuse that word faith. Um, and, and, and it's not wrong to use illustrations. In fact, I'm going to give you an illustration. I'm not sure it's a perfect illustration. Back about 20-some years ago, I was part of the youth evangelism staff called the Yes Team with the Kansas and Nebraska Convention of Southern Baptists. And by the way, you thrilled my heart today by being able to watch the uh, video series on the Reach Texas State Mission Offering. I'm so glad you're participating in that because church planning is dear to my heart, something I had to do while I was the director of missions in Kansas. We didn't have any Southern Baptist churches north of I-70. I think I had two north of I-70. We planted one, uh, we planted two while I was there in Wankini and in Smith Center. The one in Wankini didn't make it, but the one in Smith Center is still going. And so church planning is dear to my heart. Anyway, I was part of the youth evangelism staff, at, uh, and we planned all of the uh, summer camp activities. We called that our super summer up in Kansas. It's a little bit different than what super summer is here in Texas. But anyway, it was our super summer. But to be trained and to be qualified, we had to learn how to do all the ropes. Any of you ever done ropes? Any of you ever done high ropes? Yes, okay. You know what I'm talking about when I talk about it. One of those was called the leap of faith. Yeah, you know what that one is. And so this old man, who had already had heart surgery two years prior to being certified, uh, climbs up this tree, and I have this harness on, obviously, and it's collected to my chest here, and I'm really afraid that when I jump, it's going to hurt my chest. But it's called a leap of faith because you just jump out and try to touch something up there and you just just jump. And, and, and so I knew the guy down who was belaying me, it's a term we used, he had a rope behind him and he, was, he had me connected to that rope and, and he had it wrapped around another log out there for more leverage and, and he said, ready? I said, yeah, belay on, belay on, uh, jump or something. I can't remember what the next word was. And, and that was a scary moment. And, and I had to trust that Mark down there 
And he was a big man, bigger than me. And I knew that he had the ability to hold me up when I jumped. But then I just jumped. And I tried to test the thing, I didn't, but I was just glad to make it down on the ground. <sighs> and I said, Lord, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> it was contagious after that. But even in that illustration, while I trusted Mark, and I might can use that word, leap of faith, it really doesn't do justice when I begin to talk about faith in Jesus Christ. We may say, will that chair hold me up? Well, it takes faith. Well, not really. I, I have some scientific knowledge that that chair was built to be able to hold me up. Yeah, we can say that. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I told you I would do that. Or, or we might say things like, uh, I have faith that the Dallas Cowboys will be in the Super Bowl this year. That's, that's ridiculous. But anyway... <laughs> We might say things like that, but what I'm really trying to say to you this morning is that I, I want to focus in, that I want to talk about saving faith and what it means to place our faith in Christ and to live by that faith in Jesus Christ alone. We want to, to look at the Word of God the Bible is true. It's without error. It's absolute truth. Our faith in Jesus, the person that that book is about, is paramount to everything else, to anything else. It is what we have that connects us to eternal life. Without that faith in Christ, we have nothing. We have nothing. Last year I saw a TV ad, and it was uh, for students of high school. And it said, take your, it was take your Bible to school a week. Take your Bible to, to school with you. And, uh, and then at the end of the commercial, it said, live out your faith. I began to think about that for a moment. And, and it is important for us to live out our faith. I, I told that story to another student not too long ago. And that student said, my school will not let me bring my Bible to school. And I said, that doesn't mean you can't live out your faith in school. What it means is, is that we need to commit God's word to memory so that when it is applicable and when God gives us the opportunity, we need to share our faith with others, with scripture that we have hidden in our heart. Now, they let them take their phones to school and you can get the Bible on your phone so you can still get to your Bible. And there's nothing wrong in my mind in taking your Bible to school, but it really is important to live out your faith. And I want to discuss that this morning. What does it really mean? In the New Testament, it is the word pastis or pasteo in a verb form. That word pastis uh, is faith, but in the Old Testament, we'll see the word trust. And when we see the word believe or the word trust, it is of that same root word, pastis. And it means to have faith in, to place your trust in, to believe in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we see a different word, but it is that word trust, like in Proverbs chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord in all your ways, lean on into your own understanding. Trust the Lord. Place your trust. And so when we put it in the verb form, it means that I am I am walking by faith. I'm living by faith. I'm, I'm trusting Jesus Christ for all that he said he was and all that he did in our lives. So this morning, I have four different points that I want to talk about with you that come straight out of Romans chapter 5. And tonight, I'm going to carry on this discussion, so there'll be a little bit of overlap. But I want to talk about tonight is growing in faith. Today, I want to talk about living in faith. And tonight, I want to talk about what it means to, to be more of a disciple and grow in that faith. And we'll be looking at James chapter 1 tonight. 
So there's four points that I want to take. What does it mean to live by faith? The first one is living by faith means I am declared righteous. Look at verse 1 there. It says, therefore, since I am justified by faith. Now let's look at those words just for a moment. That word justified can also be translated righteous. Now I've been trying to say that we must be declared righteous because we cannot save ourselves on our own doing. I cannot make myself totally, completely holy and righteous on my own self. Only God has that ability to declare me righteous and holy. Amen. And it's through His saving faith and through His blood on the cross of Calvary, His atonement that wipes my sin clean that can even possibly declare me holy and declare me righteous. But through our faith in Jesus Christ, we believe that He died on the cross, that He rose on the grave from the grave, and that He lived on this earth for a few days, and then He ascended into heaven. And friends, He promises to come back again. And I can't wait for that day with all the things that are going on in our world. I will look forward to the day that He is going to come back. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the verse of Scripture there says, We walk by faith, not by sight. When I was a senior at Wayland Baptist University where I met my beautiful wife, I, I, we was uh, getting engaged or were engaged when I had this kind of crisis of belief in my life. I took a lot of philosophy courses. I took a lot of theology courses. Came away with a degree in religion and I'm thankful for my education at Wayland Baptist. It was, it was a, a fond memory of great people and I learned a lot. But I began to let my mind begin to go different places. And you've got to remember in the 70s, we were having this battle in our seminaries and in our colleges uh, that, that dealt with uh, some of the neo-Orthodox theology and with some of the liberal theology that was creeping into some of our textbooks. And, and such was the case pretty much with some of the things that I was reading and studying, but it was still my choice. It wasn't being forced upon me. And my mind went to other things to the point that I began to say, God, do you really exist? Are you really there? And I knew in the back of all of those questions was this 12-year-old boy, 11-year-old boy, that asked Jesus Christ into his life so many years earlier. I knew that I'd been saved. I knew that Jesus Christ was in my life. But because of my studying and the time that I was doing, I began to question God. I went to Sunday school the next morning. And the Sunday school teacher there at First Baptist Church Plainview read this passage of Scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. You walk by faith, not by sight. You see, the question I was asking was, God, I can't see you. I can't touch you. I can't feel you. I don't know if you exist. God's word permeated and just hit me right, slap John right up against the face and said, listen, Keith, you don't have to touch me. You don't have to feel me. You walk by faith, not by empirical data. That's why the word faith means so much to me because I did place my faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus even says, blessed are those who have not seen me and yet still believe. And that word believe, it is that same word as faith, pastis. It is the, the verb form to believe and to follow Jesus Christ. Second point this morning. I move through these points pretty quick. Living by faith means I stand firm in grace. And we're going to address this a little bit more tonight, but there's something I want to say here about standing firm in grace. Verse 2 says, Through Him we also have been obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. I don't know about you, but that sounds beautiful. The fact that we can stand in grace. Unmerited favor. Undeserved gift that Jesus Christ gives us is that grace. And through faith... I'm able to stand right in the middle of it. 
but get an amen with that one. Come on. I can stand right in the middle of it. Amen. amen. You can too. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ, we can stand in grace. Such a beautiful word. Such a, a beautiful term. That word stand means to continually, firmly be established in a particular state. We can be firm. We can remain in it. We can stand firm in grace. What I think that believes, what I think that is, is that old Baptist doctrine, perseverance of the saints, once saved, always saved. Once I come to know Jesus Christ as my real and personal Savior, God extends His grace and His mercy to me. The Holy Spirit comes to live in my life and I can stand firm and I know that He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. I can stand firm in grace. Amen. I remember playing baseball my first year at Stabat. It was you probably don't even remember this field because it wasn't there when you were young. But there was an old baseball field where almost a new baseball field is over there in Stanton. But it was just a pasture back then and there was no fence. So if you hit the ball far, you got a home run. You know. But I was just a seven-year-old kid and I wasn't supposed to be playing. Uh, you had to be seven before August 1st. Well, I... My, my uncle was a coach, and he convinced the head coach to draft me into their team. And about the middle of the season, he realized that I was not yet seven years old, that I was six, still six, and was not going to be seven until August 5th. So I was playing illegally. i get you fired in the NCAA now, right? But anyway, um, he let me play. He took the risk, and nobody really cared. It's just a little little kid. He's not going to make a difference out there anyway. And sure enough, I did. Most of the time, I stood up there to play baseball. I was scared. You ever been there? You know? And every time they pitched the ball, you know what I did? I didn't stand firm. <laughs> I would back out of the box. And then I would swing. And I'd strike out. Every time. Until the last game. I decided I learned something. If you were ever going to hit the ball, you had to stand in the box and you had to swing the bat. <laughs> you had to stand firm. Yeah. And that last game, I stood in the box, I swung the bat, and I hit the ball, and it went into right field. Let's tell you I was swinging late, right? But I hit it. It's the same way with our faith. You gotta trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and when you do, you're standing firm in grace. It'll never leave you. It will never forsake you. In Ephesians chapter six, verse ten through eleven, if you want to read along with me, it says, "Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand." against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The word stand or withstand is used four times in verses 11 through 14 of Ephesians chapter 6. It tells us that we are to stand up against the schemes of Satan. <laughs> he still tries to tell us untruths. He still tries to lie to us. He still tries to make us believe the lies. In verse 13 he says we got to stand up and make all the necessary preparations by putting on the whole armor of God and then we will be able to stand and, and that's a whole other sermon what it means to put on the whole armor of, God. We, uh, armor of God and then we need to stand firm in other words don't waver I don't like Christians that waver do you? we need to stand firm in our faith we need to stand firm in our belief we need to stand firm that Jesus is, is who he said he was and that he is going to come again and then last we need to stand for truth and endure by wearing the full 
armor of God. We need to stand strong in righteousness. We need to stand in the truth. We need to stand ready to share the gospel. We need to stand with faith through everything in life and good and bad. We need to stand in His salvation. We need to stand in the Spirit, which means we need to stand on the Word of God. We need to stand in prayer. And we need to stand boldly. Why? Because of His grace. We don't deserve it. Never have deserved it. And yet, He freely gives us His grace. So why not stand firm in His grace? Point number three. Living by faith means I can be joyful in spite of my circumstances. Let's look at verses, uh, the end of verse 2 through verse 5. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who He has given us. Wow. A lot of things that I could share with you about this. We'll, we'll talk more about it tonight, about circumstances and things that we go through. I've gone through several things in my life, going through some things now. Uh, just this weekend, I just lost a very dear, dear friend, Wayland Baptist friend of mine, who passed away. Some of you might have known him. He pastored at Morris for years, Gary Austin. He's a good friend. One of the good friends from Stanette found out Mark Carr has brain cancer. Um, good friend. Um, we all go through personal circumstances, but the Word of God gives us that, that in spite of the circumstances, we can live our life of faith. We can stand firm in that grace. Alex Trebek, who died just the last couple of years, he, uh, in one of his last, I think it was his last show, In Jeopardy, he said, uh, when my end comes, and it certainly will come, I can be satisfied with my life. I've had a good life. Thank you for your prayers. Can we say that when we come to the end of our life? As I'm certainly getting closer to that. Don't know when God will call me home, but I have to deal with that a little bit. I'm certainly ready. I certainly know that, that my life has been good, but it's not because of anything I've done. It's been because of everything that He has done. Hebrews 11.1, 1, I memorized it in the old King James. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust is in God. This faith is the firm foundation of everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. It's the act of faith that's what's distinguished. Our ancestors set them above the crown. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word that we are created by what we don't see. That is a quote from Eugene Peterson's book, The Message. And then he wrote another book called Burning in My Bones. He wrote, the strongest sign of authenticity in what you and I are doing is the inadequacy we feel most of the time. The greatest quality of a saint is humility. We'll talk more about this tonight, how to live and stand and grow in faith in spite of our circumstances. So I hope you'll come back tonight as we'll talk more about that. Number four, the last point this morning, living by faith means I know God loves me. Look at verse four and verse six through nine. Because God love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who He has given to us. Verse 6, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare, even dare to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Some of those verses seem a little bit hard to understand. I'm going to give you my take on that. Um, one of the verses, uh, at, at verse 5 says, While we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. What does that word powerless mean? I believe it's a reference to the power of the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit comes. While we were still living uh, the way that Abraham lived, the way that uh, the Old Testament lived, by obeying the law, but still you had to place your faith in in God. If you go back and look at chapter 4, in fact, the way chapter 5 starts, therefore since, well, the therefore tells us, okay, there's something up in front of that that we need to look at. And, and if, you, if you want to look at the chapter 4, uh, every time I circle the word either believe or faith, and it's there several times. Verse 3 says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. In other words, he believed God he was declared righteous. Uh, verse 5, he believes in him who justifies the other God. His faith is counted as righteousness. Uh, verse 9, for we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. Uh, verse 12, uh, who is not merely the circumcised, but also walked in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Uh, verse uh, 13, the last part of it, but through the righteousness of faith. Verse 16, that is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. Uh, verse 17, in the presence of God in whom he believed. Again, it's that root word, pastis. Uh, verse 20, but he grew strong in his faith. Uh, in verse 22, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 24, but ours also as we will be counted on to us who believes in him. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. All of a sudden now, it's, it, the, the subject sw the shifts from Abraham to us. And I would, I would suggest to you that the same faith that Abraham had that brought him up from Ur of Chaldees up to the Fertile Crescent into the Promised Land that God said, someday I'm going to give your, your, your relatives that same faith that he had in God that declared him righteous is the same faith that you and I have now. We can look at Jesus, though, who gave his everything, and we place our faith in Jesus because of what he did for us on the cross. Why would he do that? Because he loves us. Because he lost us. He died on the cross to atone for our sin. And he demonstrated his love for us on that cross by dying for you and for me. I can't comprehend all of that, honestly. I don't understand all the what the atonement means. I believe it. I place my faith in Jesus Christ that that death, burial, resurrection takes care of my sin problem. And that's why He loves me so much that He wants us to be free from that sin problem. You see, He said there, uh, very rarely will one die for a righteous man, but some might die for a good man. But then you've got to read the next verse to understand those two verses. But God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, you see, you can't be righteous enough on your own. You can't be good enough on your own because we are sinners. That while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Only he can declare us righteous. We can never be good enough on our own merit to declare ourselves righteous. We cannot make ourselves righteous. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Which is why I added verse 9 to my memory verse. Because it puts another therefore. It says since therefore. 
verses 1 through 8. Since therefore you have been justified, you have been declared righteous by his what? Blood. And here's the good news. You've been saved from the wrath of God. Yeah. Folks, we don't preach it much anymore, but there is a judgment day coming. Amen. And there is a literal place called hell. And the wrath of God, everything will be placed in that place, separated from God for eternity. But the good news is, we can be declared righteous by faith. That's what it means to me to live by faith. This morning, my heart is heavy for a lot of reasons, but my heart should be heavy mostly if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ and has never accepted Jesus Christ as your real personal Savior. I never assume, I, I've preached in churches from the size of two in Kansas, or I've only had two people, to literally thousands in Kansas at our church at uh, Prosper. Doesn't matter what size, from two to a thousand, I always present the gospel of Jesus Christ because there could be someone here that has never had a one time experience of knowing Jesus Christ as your real and personal Savior. I never assume anything. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. If you've never asked Christ into your life, why not today? Yeah. Why not place your faith and trust that He is who He said He is and accept Him and live this life of joy that can come only by doing that? It's real simple. You simply pray a prayer and invite Him to come into your life and say, Dear Jesus, I accept you as the resurrected living Christ, the one who died on the cross of Calvary, the one who died for my sin. Please come into my life and forgive me of my sin of unbelief. I now trust you as my Lord and Savior. Are you willing to pray that prayer? Are you willing to ask Jesus into your life? You know, my mother, I thought she was a Christian almost all of her life. She was the reason we ended up in church. She is the reason Daddy changed his life. The power of Jesus did that, trust me. But she was that one witness in our, in our home that said, go to church, go to church, go to church. And when I was in high school, invitation was given. We had sung the last verse. We were fixing to go out the door. And my mother stood up and said, wait. Wait. Don't stop now took a lot of courage. She stood up, walked to the altar after everything was over and said, I need to give my life to Christ. I've never, ever done it. I was just living a life of untruth. I admired my mother for doing that. But there may be someone here just like that. You may just be living a fake life. Going to church doesn't cut it. That's not faith. I would even say just reading your Bible leads you to faith. And you should read your Bible. It is true. Absolutely. But it's the man of the book that we place our faith in. Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this moment and time.